Again, I want to extend my deepest thanks and appreciation for the staff and for my family and for all of you for giving me good, holy space away from the office for the past several days. I've been on a short, really short study leave. Uh, it turned out to be a little shorter than expected with the weather, but I found myself away from the office and from my home for a few days in Broken Bow, Oklahoma, uh, studying and, and praying and meditating on my role as a senior minister on where we're headed in worship and spent a lot of time um, discerning what we as a congregation need uh, for the development and deepening of our discipleship. And I did, I really did spend a lot of time sort of thinking about my role here. And I must say um, that I am entering my 14th year of ministry and there are so many things, obviously, that I still need to learn. I'm sure my staff could agree to that. Uh, there are many things that I need to improve on. Um, but after doing something, anything, I think, for 14 years, you begin to, to recognize just how much you've learned over the course of the past several years. And one of the privileges that I have as sort of a pastor is uh, to sit with folks in times of stress and trauma, grief and struggle, no doubt. I've counseled and spiritually walked with folks through all sorts of things, terminal illness, death of a loved one. I've spent time with folks who are struggling with addiction or estrangement from their children, pregnancy loss, infidelity, I've celebrated and blessed marriages. I've baptized babies, which is one of my favorite things to do. I've confirmed students who've made a profession of faith. I've prayed for answers to life's mysteries with desperate disciples, and I've welcomed people into the faith. All of it, every single bit of my pastoral role here at First Church is an honor, a privilege, and one that you give to me. Not because of who I am, but because of the role I have among our community and congregation, a role that in many ways found me. And it has been surprising, though, where so much of my time and pastoral work is spent, regardless of context, regardless of age, for every crisis that I enter into, for every marriage that I do premarital counseling with, for every funeral that I help plan and preside over, I've spent three sessions with folks who can't articulate clearly why we're sharing a cup of coffee, why we're having a conversation. There's this restlessness. And while these conversations look different, the thread that connects them all is this, really is this undefined restlessness and an inability they have to feel settled, to feel at peace. And I pick up on this quickly because I've felt that same feeling. I know what that is like. I know when our soul or spirit is uncomfortable or anxious, or unsettled. What's so fascinating is this unnamed feeling, this undefined restlessness, often leads us to talk about a person's purpose in the world. And then, of course, the big questions begin, the ones that I cannot answer for them. Why do I exist? What is my real purpose in this life? What am I actually doing with my life currently? The vast majority, not all, but most can be directly tied to a spiritual wrestling with one's vocation. Vocation in the broadest sense is a strong connection, a suitability that one has with a career or occupation, but from a spiritual health, a faith perspective, it's where we as individuals, we generate meaning and we generate 
purpose. So I'm very excited today that we start a brand new worship series that we're calling Hopes and Dreams. It is a series on discovery. It's a series focused on discernment, on vocation, on purpose. And it's built around this powerful quote from Frederick Buechner. He says that our vocation, our purpose in this world is found at the exact intersection where our passions, gifts, natural way of being, life-giving skills that we possess meet the world's greatest need. We are created for a reason, for a purpose, and discovering that is all about finding that one point, that point where we, what we are, what we're good at, what we're passionate about collides with the world's greatest need. That moment of intersection, that is our vocation. So much of my time with people is helping them see the deep spiritual truth that this quote offers us. And so for the next several weeks, we're going to be exploring this. We're going to be talking about the power in serving the needs of the world, how we can find our purpose, what we're passionate about, how we can identify our gifts and our graces, what makes us tick, why we get out of bed each morning, and why it is important for us as a church to live together, to be in community where all of us are striving after this purpose or vocation in our life. We're going to cover a lot of ground in the next several weeks. But this morning, today we start with the challenges that keep us from seeing, from seeing that point of intersection, which often feels hidden from us. Our text is 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. I invite you to open your Bibles and read along or grab a pew Bible where you can find our text on page 293. Someone tell me what the page number is. I was supposed to write it down. What's the page number? 259. 259 in the pew Bible, okay? We're all there. Sort of a dense text, so I really do invite you to read along. 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 13. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? I've rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I name to you. So Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? And he said, Peaceably. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely his anointed is now before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Then Jesse called Abinabad and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, there remains yet the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. 
And Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. And the Lord said, rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel then set out and went to Ramah. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer, the one who is calling us, beckoning us, inviting us to see that our lives are meant for something special. May we have the ability to see what you see, O God. Amen. The first, really, the first few stories in Samuel are all about the sort of choosing and wrestling that Samuel has with God, sort of beginning to understand his role as a prophet, as one who speaks on behalf of God to God's people. And really, first and second Samuel, all of the stories of those two books really hinge right here on David's anointing. The prophet Samuel, Samuel has been chosen by God to carry out the managing of Israel's anxiety, essentially, by speaking for God and anointing the king that the Israelites have demanded from God. Just real quick so you remember, the Israelites, after wandering in the wilderness for quite some time, enter into the promised land through rather violent means. They build their nation state and they grow restless without a clear, accessible, tangible leader. They want a king to represent their interests. God concedes in part by assigning and appointing judges who negotiate and mediate on behalf of the people. The Israelites, though, remain anxious, as people often do, unsatisfied and continue to, to demand a king. And the hope God had for God's chosen people, the hope that God had for the Israelites was that they would rely on God as the one who is leading them Somewhere along the line, God concedes, negotiates, and changes course, and the people are given a king. God essentially agrees to establish a monarchy, and Saul is chosen with Samuel's input. Saul and Samuel have a close bond, and Saul, who is seen as the perfect prototype for a king, Strong, tall, very tall, doesn't need risers in the boots, tall, you know, good looking, charismatic, served the people and nation well. But Saul failed to follow God's instruction and commands concerning the war with the Amalekites. And so God instructs Samuel to find a new king. God is done with Saul. The choosing of a king involves the anointing of the chosen with oil. And this anointing serves as an outward sign, an expression of a covenant that God makes with the chosen leader. Samuel is instructed to go find a new leader and is not very thrilled with this idea. So our text picks up with God saying, how long will you be upset about the fact that I have rejected Saul? Essentially saying, stop crying about it and go do what I've told you to do. Go find us a new king. Go to Bethlehem, invite Jesse and his sons, and there in that family you will find the new leader of Israel. Get going. 
Stop crying about it. Early in the text, Samuel's boo-hooing about Saul turns actually into fear. As anointing a new king, while there is a current king, can easily be seen as treason. It can create civil war, social unrest. There is no peaceable transfer of power from one living king to another. And God and Samuel hatch a plan to disguise this anointing, which ends with David being divinely chosen, anointed, and essentially given the title of Israel's new king in waiting. God chooses David. God makes a covenant with David. And God and David are connected through this anointing of oil. And as I move rather swiftly into my second decade of ministry, one thing that I have become certain of, one thing that I believe without a doubt, is that this promise and anointing of God is available to each and every one of us. We are all, all being anointed for something You, specifically you, not the person behind you in the pew, you, you were created for something. Something bigger than simply existing. Something infinitely more important than simply existing for yourself. We are all called. We are all chosen. We are all empowered for something beyond ourselves. And while the stories of Scripture often speak of the anointing and the anointing of the most well-known and historically relevant characters, make no mistakes, friends. This idea of anointing someone for something is the work of the people for the people. The act of anointing, naming, and defining the roles and responsibilities of individuals is not something that is simply reserved for kings and queens and judges and leaders who take armies into battle. Each and every one of us is anointed for something, and this anointing would have happened within the community because once someone is anointed, it is a covenant, an outward sign of God's promise to that individual. And friends, God has made a promise to you. You are created for something special. The issue, like Samuel, is that we often cannot see like God sees. We are blinded, limited in seeing the world the way our Creator does. You know, one of the first names given to God, El Roy is a, is a name that means the God who sees. Hagar offers this name for God as she is trying to outrun her current situation. Hagar, who is Abraham and Sarah's maidservant, is rather forcibly married to Abraham and gives birth to Abraham's firstborn son, Ishmael, raising issues, no doubt, about consent, creates dramatic family system issues, and Hagar is trying to escape, and God meets her in the wilderness. God sees her like no one else can see her. Because God sees what we cannot see. David's anointment is entirely dependent on God's ability to see what Samuel cannot does not see. Samuel is focused on what the world is obsessed with. Samuel is looking for success, for power, for purpose through the eyes of the world. Surely 
Samuel is thinking, whoever is worthy of being the new king must indeed look the part. Like Samuel, we look for our purpose and power and meaning through a lens crafted out of the world's expectations. When we are discerning and wrestling, struggling with our own purpose, we are most often using worldly made glasses and evaluating our purpose through spiritually empty eyes. Your purpose, your purpose is not to make the most money you can. Your purpose is not to become a freshly minted member of the C-suite. Your purpose is not to please others by living out their expectations for you. Your purpose isn't to look the part or fulfill your parents' unrealized dreams or keep the peace by bearing down and simply preserving. You were not created to suffer the work week or suffer through a job you hate. You weren't created to simply float through retirement until you die. You haven't been created to simply sit quietly just because your body is beginning to fail. Each and every one of us in this room, we are all created for something bigger. We are all created for something much more important than the world's feeble attempts to anoint us with counterfeit oil. We exist beyond the world's expectations and limitations. The text tells us as much. In verse 7, the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance. Do not use the world's standard as a measuring stick. Don't pay attention to his height, his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see, the Lord does not see as mortals see. Mortals look on the outward appearance. The world looks on the superficial things. But the Lord looks on the heart. The Lord does not see as the world sees. Finding the point of intersection, that place where our passion meets the world's greatest need, requires a godly vision, an ability to begin seeing the way that God sees. This is the greatest hurdle. This is what causes the anxiety and the restlessness when I discuss people's purpose in my office, when I sit across a cup of coffee and they can't articulate why they are feeling so unsettled, it is because they continue to evaluate their life, their meaning, their purpose through the lens of the world. And we, we will always remain restless, feeling unfulfilled if our life is dictated, defined, anointed by the expectations of others or self-defined notions of success. So as we enter into this phase of discernment, as we continue in this series focused on purpose and meaning and vocation, the good news, friends, the good news is God. God is the one who meets us in unexpected ways, in unsuspecting places. God is the one who sees us in the midst of this journey that we are on. Just like Hagar and David, we too are anointed for something bigger than ourselves. And whether you are 14 years old or you are 87 years old, you were created for something great. So what will you do with your life? What will you do, as Mary Oliver says, with your wild and beautiful life? I hope it can be, I hope and pray it can be. I'm not joking. I literally hope and I'm literally praying this week that it can be what God is calling you to be for yourself and for others because the world 
desperately needs that person to show up each and every day. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.